Welcome to the High Performance CEO Show, your exclusive insight into the strategies and success habits of the world's top CEOs. I'm your host, Sebastian Schieke, entrepreneur, mentor, and business angel. Prepare to grow your business, enhance your leadership skills, and thrive in today's world. Let's dive in. Welcome to another episode of the High Performance CEO Show. Today I'm talking to Jason Kingsley. Jason Kingsley, OBEC co-founder and the CEO of Rebellion, which is a true British success story. Following his degree at Oxford, Jason established Rebellion with his brother Chris in 1992. And the company has since then become one of the world's most successful independent video game developers and publishers. Games like Snipers Elite 5, um, Alien vs. Predators, um, Zombie Army, Evil Genius, and many more games you might recognize have been produced and created by Jason's company. He also um, is a decorated and accomplished writer, having captained the British student writing team to success at the World Cup while at university. He has an amazing YouTube channel, Modern History. Before this interview, I watched probably half an hour his, his, his videos. Very interesting stuff. And uh, he's now publishing his book, Leading the Rebellion, Questing to Succeed in Work and Life. Amazing read. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having you here. That uh, makes me sound very grand. Uh, um, it's been a long and busy life I've had. <laughs> <laughs> A very interesting life, obviously. Yeah? So, yes, reading your your CV, and uh, um, I had the pleasure to uh, have a copy of your book. And uh, we share a lot of values uh, about life and business, and this is why it's a really pleasure for me having you here in the show. And I mean, I have so far no real um, touch with with history, the medieval history. So I was fascinated by uh, watching your videos and. Uh, learning about the myth and uh, and why they had these small doors uh, in, <laughs> in their houses. So yeah, maybe start a little bit uh, telling about your story, uh, where you come from and how this all developed. I mean, I've, how did you? Well, I've always been very, I've always tried to be quite independent. So I went through the sort of normal academic uh, school, did, did my kind of exams at various stages then went to Oxford University did a zoology degree and sort of did academic training but while I was doing all the academic work and sort of learning the, the scientific principles of the hypothesis and experiment I was also fascinated by business and I was fascinated by creative business in particular so writing books or playing computer games or whatever it might be and then the opportunity came up with a growing industry the computer games industry my brother was very interested in programming so we decided once we'd both left university to um, have a go at doing it professionally, but not with the intent really of making a fortune or making making a lot of money or making a success of it, other than to do cool stuff and have fun with a pursuit we felt you know we could probably earn a living from it, and if you can earn a living and have fun, then that's great. You know you're the wealthiest person on the planet. Yeah, quite frankly, we talked about how. Wealth doesn't buy happiness. In fact, yeah. sometimes you see a lot of wealthy people and I get annoyed and I go, well, why aren't you doing anything really creative and fun? You've got tons of money. You've got more money yeah. than you could ever spend. So do something cool with it. Help people. Make something lovely. Make something interesting. I I've always felt that was an interesting issue with our society in general. And, and, and it's ethics. It's about ethics. And the book, the book started, I was, I was studying the chivalric code which I'd sort of heard about in an early, early, uh, when I was a boy. And I just thought it was a set of rules written down. And the more I looked at it, the more it moved away. It, it was, um, it was more an ethos. It was more a set of guidelines to help society deal with armed groups of men with armor and, and horses and, uh, spears and yeah. swords. It was an attempt, I think an early attempt for society to codify a form of behavior 
to make w- the world a better place. And, world of conduct. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of it is about striving to be a better person. It's not necessarily about succeeding. It's about the path you take in the journey to be a better human being. And it suddenly occurred to me that I'd lived my business life and my kind of fantasy life, if you like, my medieval side of things and my love of fantasy books like Lord of the Rings and TV shows and uh, moves like Hawk the Slayer. They came together and I suddenly realized there were ethics behind all of it. There was a way of behaving and a way of doing business that especially these days when we've got a lot of very wealthy people whose ethics are not really front and center of their public persona, mm. I felt it was an opportunity to, to, to address that in a tiny way. Yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, you obviously did very well. You know, you had the plan of feeding yourself. Now you feed about 500 people, which is a bit of an achievement. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Very, Conc- very concrete for that. Yeah, and, and families as well, because one of the things I yeah. think in, in a leadership position, you've obviously got various pools on your yeah. time, You, but, but I think at the base of it, you've got a bunch of talented individuals who have families these days. You know, when we first started, it was often, it was mostly young men in the computer games industry. Now it's, it's, it's yeah. all sorts of people and all sorts of ages, including people that were born at times when I remember very clearly being alive. You know, we, it's amazing as you get older, this idea that what you thought was a long time in the past is actually a really yeah. long time in the past for some people. <laughs> it becomes historic. I remember seeing one of yeah. one of my first, uh, was a, people might not remember, the Nintendo Game Boy, the original grey Nintendo oh, Game yeah, Boy. Yeah. It was like a brick of a game. Brilliant machine. Yeah. Nintendo are a brilliant company. Um, and I went to a museum. I was I was a guest of honour and I saw toys that I'd had as a boy in the museum and I suddenly became grey and old instantly you know I just thought wow this is amazing but that also <laughs> makes you think of a little bit about history and about going back into our past and then beyond that how did people think of themselves did medieval mm. people ever go well I'm a medieval person and the answer is no they didn't it's only now we can look at them back then they were just people My first computer was an Amiga. Uh, oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Very nice computer. 32, 32 colors. I can remember the early days of having to use yeah. pixels to actually do pixel art on the screen. And uh, and that, that was state of the arts. And you look back at old computer games. And one of the key things that's changed in computer games isn't necessarily the gameplay. It's the graphics and what yeah. we can do now on the screen. Whereas the gameplay it's is still amazing. very solid. Yeah. I mean, as you said, I mean... Probably when you started, uh, the the whole um, gaming industry was a couple of people, young lads sitting in a room, uh, starting to code, kind of the, the typical nerds which we um, see. Yeah, but but now it's a really established uh, business, and uh, it's uh, it's larger than I think you you mentioned in your in your book, larger than um, the TV industry. Yes, larger than the film industry and the TV industry and the music yeah. industry. It, it's massive. What what's interesting is I think it's it's almost snuck up on everybody in in authority in that. You know, I, mm-hmm. I talk to colleagues at the BBC, for example, and I I talk to members of the of, of the UK Parliament because I'm uh, I'm chair of a trade organisation. So I, I I talk to uh, our bosses, if you like, in 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 government, and yeah. um, a lot of them aren't that familiar with the games industry, which is quite strange. But is is I think because the games industry has grown and changed so rapidly that it's hard to keep up with it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so one of the one of my jobs is to educate them about games are for a huge audience. There's, a, there's hundreds of millions of people throughout the world that play games. And we can make a game in, in the UK and it can be played all around the world. It can be exported, but it doesn't have to be exported on ships burning diesel. It can be yeah. sent over the wires, you know, the internet. Yeah, this wonderful thing that uh, empowers us all and probably infuriates us all as well, the internet. It allows us to actually get smaller as a world and see what other people yeah, are doing. Definitely. I mean, I spent the last six months in, in New Zealand, having being in touch with people, running my shows. Uh, it's uh, it's amazing how small the world has become. Nowadays, we have friends everywhere. You know, we we, we hardly meet, and uh, it's like uh, meeting them down in the pub. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. It's, it's a lots of opportunities to connecting with new like-minded people which otherwise you may, would never be able to because um, they are yeah. somewhere else physically in the world. Well, I, uh, find, I find it interesting. I think there are different forms of friendship these days as well because yeah. I realized I know a lot of, I've got a lot of YouTubing colleagues that work in the sort of mm-hmm. the, the, the 
the medievalish space so live action role playing and maybe movies and games and, and they're, they're all friends of mine and um i met one of them in in real life and i i said to him to this particular individual i said this is a bit weird i kind of know you really well from your work <laughs> and from you you know from zoom videos and video conferencing yeah. and chats but we've not actually physically met in the same space on the planet have we he went no, it's weird for me as well. I kind of feel like you're a friend that I've never actually met. Um, and and I think for you, for me, we've got a we've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that that know us through our work. Yeah. And our work is quite broad. You know, it's not like it's scripted. It's not like an actor who's got a scripted line to say. And it, you know, it's, this is this is us. You know, we're talking now and giving people our our, our feedback and our opinions. So people actually know us quite well in some ways. They know an aspect of us. And I think that's, that's actually quite wonderful. I was in, uh, I traveled to America a few years ago and I was waiting in the, in the line for the, um, for security, you know, to have my bags really? checked. And I was wearing this red shirt, well, not this one, but a, another red shirt yeah. similar to the one I use sometimes in, in my videos. And this big bloke came up to me and was carrying a gun and I was thinking, oh no, here we go. I'm going <laughs> to miss my flight, aren't I? And he went, come with me, sir. And I thought, oh oh well never mind i haven't got anything to hide so it's just going to be lots of time and uh he said i'm a huge fan of your youtube channel <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and would you like to come through here and beat the queue and i felt a bit guilty because i don't i don't really like yeah jumping yeah. the queue because i'm a celebrity or whatever because i'm not a celebrity i'm just me but um in this particular case i thought fine i can't really go to the back of the queue can i uh, I'll, I'll take the the opportunity we had a nice little chat he checked my bags and waved me through and told me a shortcut to get to the lounge and uh and i just thought that's really odd uh but really kind of interesting <laughs> people throughout the world can know our work yeah. you wrote this uh, this book and you have this code of conduct yeah which mm -hmm. you sort of translated into the modern business world yes that's that's the idea i, I was i was going through the chivalric code of trying to find out where it was written down and it's been written down in lots of different ways and different cultures have different uh, sort of thoughts about what it is. It was never really formalized. There was never a sort of a central yeah. kind of central place that defined the chivalric code. It was a, it emerged in different places at different times in different ways. A lot of it comes from the Languedoc, the southern parts of France that weren't actually France. They were the Occitan region and they, they had their own religion and all that kind of stuff. It, and it's also synonymous with troubadours and these sort of romantic courtly uh, plays which is really interesting it overlays that whole sort of high medieval early medieval high medieval stuff um and obviously uh, france and england were great rivals uh in the well, medieval period uh, lots of wars all the time uh but there was also a shared there was a shared culture of of, of behaving well the trouble is some of it doesn't map very well yeah you know, there's a there's a whole area of uh about the chivalric codes in certain aspects of them about um going over to the middle east and and kind of fighting against the enemies of the of the christian mm. uh, christian god which of course is is and it's very male orientated as well so what i've tried to do is in, interpret them on a broader way and say this this applies to not just men it applies to everybody and it applies outside the kind of combat locations you know what does fidelity yeah. what does faithfulness mean what does bravery mean in a business context what does wisdom mean in a business context and all of these things obviously have been interpreted in different ways by different people i found some bits missing as well which is which might amuse you for example the in the um holy roman empire the area that there's now germany and sort of north northern europe the the concept of humility in knights is not really talked about very much which i find fascinating okay. whereas humility in french frankish areas and 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 England was was considered to be a knightly virtue, whereas humility in the German and, and Northern European areas was not. And I I kind of I don't know why. It just seems to be the way it developed over time. And, okay. And and yeah. also a lot of people failed as well. People failed to be chivalric all the time. And I think that's what we need to be aware of. So we we can't be perfect. We shouldn't be try to be perfect. We should try to do our the best we can and in the circumstances. Exactly, it's a process. You know, every day you try to improve one percent. You know, and it, 
it's a journey. Yeah, we will never reach this uh, end goal. And uh, yeah, well, I think that's, that's also the, the the story of the 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 King Arthur's knights and searching for the Holy Grail, and pretty much all of them never find it. I think one one knight, Percival, finds it, but can't get hold of it. He sees it. He sees the Holy yeah. Grail. And, and the principle really is it's the journey. Uh, the journey is the thing, the only thing we yeah. can control. The end the end game, well, sadly, we all know what the end game for all of us is. You know, we, we, we'll pass on our knowledge, hopefully, to other people, and then off we go. But it's what we leave behind. It's what we've done on that journey. And I've tried to live my life in a way that does has a positive impact on people as much as I can, and also that I enjoy as well. I'm not a puritan, yeah. you know. I, I like a good glass of wine sometimes, or mead. Actually, I'm really into mead at the moment. Really like that, you know. And and I probably fail sometimes to meet the ideal chivalric goals, but I'm still trying. That the, the, the trying is the thing. Exactly. Yeah, intentionally trying to implement these these habits into your life, you know, and uh, to have an impact and yeah. also to be happy. I mean, you touched in the beginning on uh, that many people, especially who are very wealthy and, and rich, are unhappy. Yeah, And uh, the question is, why is that? You know, why? I mean, they have every resources in the world. Yeah? They have um, everything they uh, they can dream of and, and still they... Um, they are unhappy. They're striving for more. They um, don't find joy in small things. Oh, um, I, I, they don't mm. contribute. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They they just store their money and don't have any any exciting adventures. Really. Um, yeah. I think it comes down to how you see yourself, and I think for a lot of people, money is a substitute, somehow a score they keep yeah, yeah. to prove to themselves that they're doing well. But there are yep. so many, there are many happy, rich people, of course, don't get me wrong. And I'm not saying that, but there also seem to be a large number that are, or at least give the impression that they're quite dysfunctional, that they're searching yep. after things that are unobtainable, no matter how much money you have. Because once you get to a certain perspective, a certain point in, in, in financial security, and I, I'm not saying being rich is a bad thing. I, I think there's a point at which it becomes absurd that having yeah. multiple billions and doing nothing with it seems to be a bit weird to me, then that's my yeah. perspective. And I, I guess I don't have multiple billions. So, um, but, but you also get people that seem to be very unhappy with their own selves, you know, their body image and what they do to themselves. Wow. And there, there are a lot of, I think our society tends to breed paranoia in the media that, that the media talks about bad stories because they're the ones that get people's attention. Clicks. Yes. And, and it creates this spiral of, of terrible things going on. And very rarely do you hear small good things happening to people because they're not, they're not clickable. Positive news. It doesn't sell. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, when you look at uh, the news, uh, it's 95% uh, uh, trauma um, stories, uh, especially here in, in, in Western Europe. Oh. I, as I said, I spent six months in New Zealand. And uh, when you look at the news there, it's... Um, much more local, you know. I mean, um, the other day there was an article about a horse who fall into a trap, you know, <laughs> into a hole. Yeah, yeah. And this was on the on the front page of the um, newspaper. Yeah. And I think this is uh, this really um, primes people in a different uh, direction. They are much more happier because they are not uh, focused on all these uh, traumas, and also they are, they don't have so much money compared to people in Western Europe, for example. They are happy. I mean. And to tell you a quick story, I was uh, I was there with my son, you know, and I was driving from, he was doing um, hockey, driving into underwater hockey on a Friday evening. And uh, he was hungry, yeah? So, I mean, there's nothing out, and we, just, we stopped at one of these um, small um, kiosks, you know, I mean, uh, very basic store. And uh, so I got him a pack of um, cookies, yeah? And uh, not the healthiest thing, but there was nothing else available. <laughs> so I went to the... Um, cash point and took my phone because back then, I mean, I hardly carried any cash. It was all um, wireless. Uh, um, and I uh, wanted to put my phone on the machine and then there was a sign called no pay wave. Your pay wave is the um, system to a wireless, a contactless payment. And I said, oh, shit, you know, I can't buy these cookies now for my son because I have no cash with me. And you know what this guy said? I'll just take it. Oh, wow. He just, he just handed me the cookies. I mean, it was a a very um, simple uh, store. This guy probably didn't have much money, yeah. 
and he was giving me this cookie for, I don't know, $5. Yeah. And that would never happen to me here in Western Europe. I mean, uh, it's it really, I mean, the next day I went there and I gave him this money and I said, thank you. And, uh, but I, I was so, I was so touched, you know, by this mm. gesture of giving me these cookies. And I thought, Hey, why are we always so, um, um, our default mode here is, um, distrust, you know, we don't trust people there. The default mode is trust. First, they trust you. Yeah. They give you something. Uh, and this is, this is so no much, this is such a difference. And, um, sometimes I really ask why, why are we like that? You know? Yeah. Why, why don't, why don't we trust? Why don't we give first before we receive? I agree. And I do wonder if it's to do with, um, the the algorithms in the media and in the sort of the the content we consume the the newspaper mm-hmm. newspaper headlines equivalent uh, the other newspapers are kind of declining but the idea of the, the the newspaper is trying to sell copies of the newspaper so they put a an outrageous headline that asks a question and you even if you don't buy the newspaper you read it and you think oh no something bad has happened and that constant drip 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 of yeah people try to get your attention with 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 outrageous headlines you know, the click the equivalent of clickbait titles clickbait, yeah. uh, before clickbait was a thing um just wears you down it, it's called, it sort of it it makes your brain think all of these things are happening all the time i mean looking at the research i was doing for my medieval stuff looking through the court roles and uh, uh and thing bad things that happened um it was a much more violent place, the medieval world. There wasn't yeah, a police force. You know, you go outside the the, the major cities, there wasn't really a, a there was sort of was justice, but it was small scale, like ma- local magistrates. So somebody's pig ate your apples, uh, and that was a big issue because you know you didn't have that much food. Yeah. There wasn't a supermarket to go to, and if you know people laugh, you know people laugh, and it is small, but it's also big for people that live in that kind of agrarian place. Um, but, uh, you know, cesspits overflowing and um, people falling into wells and uh, these things, but they mattered for those people. But the amount of communication they had was based on the speed of a horse. There were no broadcast mm-hmm. headlines to say yeah. somebody in this big city has been murdered that because you would hear about it because it didn't matter because that was 50 miles away and it's irrelevant. And by the time anybody told you, you say, well, so what? But there was much more violence happening, but there was no communication of that news to all, to, to all of us. So it's almost this flow of information that the internet has given us, which kind of makes us more sensitive and want mm-hmm. to consume more negative stuff. I, I've noticed my, myself, I, I've taken various apps off my mobile phone yeah. because I thought, what am I doing? i I spend a lot of time creating content. Sure, I try to create content that's evergreen, that asks questions: how long, yeah, how far can you travel on a horse? You know, uh, that kind of thing, which doesn't helps people escape a little bit from the the, the real world. Sorry, how far can you? <laughs> uh, well, if you're going really fast, about fifty five miles, you can ride Fuck. about fifty five, sixty miles in a day, but you'll be really sore and really tired. But an average, an average sort of pottering along, having fun, maybe stopping for lunch. Well, 20, 25 miles on a horse on, okay. on foot is roughly 15 if you're traveling gently you can you can march and long distance yeah, walkers yeah. do a lot further than that but but i'm talking about people traveling because they've got to travel not because they're trying to beat a time or they're not long distance marathon runners or anything like that and that means i've, I've, I've i haven't done it there's a video coming out soon which is a difference about tav- taverns and inns uh and inns were places you stayed and they're often located at roughly a day's travel from one place yeah. to another, so and on crossroads. So you would you would decide you're going from Oxford to Canterbury, and it would be a certain distance. I don't know how many days travel, probably four or five days at least. You would expect to stop for four or five nights at these inns, and you would meet people coming the other way, and you'd meet people going north to south as well as east to west, and you'd mingle in a in a in a sort of this melting pot of this sort of location where everybody's going to stay the night and everybody's moving they've got their journeys and you know you'll just meet them they'll just be in the tap room they'll be drinking beer or mead with you and uh, you might have a conversation they might go oh, did you realize that there's a new king a new king of england it's like is there does it make any difference no 
taxes the same? Yes. <laughs> Money the same? Yeah, mostly. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. cool. Or we, we've evaded France yet, have we? Oh, blimey, not again. Does that make any difference to us? Not really, unless they come around and make some of us join the army. Uh, we've still got to get the turnips in. We've still got to pick the apples. We've yeah, still got well. to look after our pigs. And and, and I, I just, this this immediate news and, and the news media wanting your attention yeah. is the thing that sensitizes us to this negativity. Definitely. The, the question which, which uh, sort of came up for me is, are there records about mental health in the medieval times? Are have these people been happier? Or I mean, they obviously. I mean, you said it's a very brutal time. Uh, they've been very poor, but they had not this um, this constant um, incoming negativity in terms of uh, news and and messages. Are there any records? Uh, no, very few. There's a few. If you read between the lines, you could you can hear people coming back from wars that had PTSD, or at least mm. they never wanted to go anywhere again and became recluses, or yeah. you know, wanted to just you know stop the world. I want to get off. You could you could imply that's um, uh, a mental health issue potentially, quite a severe one. I mean, medieval mm. war was brutal. Um, utterly brutal. Yeah. It's not. I'm not saying modern war isn't brutal, and a lot of it's sort of gunfire. Uh, but medieval war was very close up, uh, and it, yeah. you also had people that were more used to life and death because they often they would also often kill their own animals to eat them. You know, the the uh, tragedies like um, childbirth caused a lot of women to die, a lot of children to die as well. You know, you, roughly fifty percent of people didn't make it to adulthood. Yeah, I, I just learned this uh, half an hour ago when I watched one of your videos. <laughs> and so I think there's a, perhaps a bit more fatalism as well. If you've had six children and only three of them mm. have lived to adulthood, that would give you a certain perspective on the world. And, and I think times were really bad for women. I think they were bad for men, but they were really bad for women. They're, they're, certainly in the medieval period, uh, women did have rights in different parts of the of, of the country, of, of, of Europe as well. And the further north you go, more into sort of Viking-dominated areas, women had many more rights. So it seems to be towards the south they had fewer rights. Well, they, they, it was it's very complicated and and try to generalise. But of course, women were having babies. There was no form of contraception. Women were having babies at a very young age as well. You know that 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 people were remarried. Fourteen, fifteen was perfectly normal age to be married. If you were well, if you were very wealthy, if you were aristocracy, you were often you kind of married when you were children, um, which meant that you didn't necessarily marry somebody you liked. You married because they had land and you wanted to join them together, which yeah, is why yeah. lots of kings had mistresses because they had mistresses for love and affection and they had wives for off was... offspring and, and political reasons. So that, yeah. that sort of gone away to a certain extent now. And that could have been very nice. But I suppose if you're born into that uh, and it's what you expect, that will be fine. But the yeah, diseases and plague. Imagine, imagine the Black Death sweeping through from yeah. from Marseille all the way up through um, Europe, and imagine roughly a third to a half of everybody you know dying. And I, I mean, Gone. we can reflect on that a bit more because we, you know, we're just coming out of a pandemic, but a pandemic that killed tiny proportion of people. Compared still, to still a tragic, but tiny proportion. And I, I'm being affected by it personally and I pretty much everybody I know has been directly or indirectly affected by it scale that up 10 times yeah how does that affect I imagine it affects everybody really badly so there's a lot of uh, learning we can um, take from the past yeah take from uh, medieval times and um, I mean writing your book coming up this this 12 chapters. What do you think are the most important learnings for people in today's age? I personally, in business in particular, I think bravery is really important. Bravery yeah. and honesty. Oh, now, I love honesty. Yeah. yeah. Honesty doesn't mean you have to tell everybody everything. It means you're honest to yourself. Now, now business yeah. is sometimes likened to war and it can be. It can be a book. You know, you could be trying to win more customers, more clients. You could be trying to get market share fine yeah that that is battle not battle with swords and you know swords and you know, yeah, cavalry yeah. and knights in armor but it is a form of battle sure therefore you need your strategies and you might need to plan 
and you might need to react to circumstances that you didn't expect. I think, I think that's really important. But I think honesty to yourself and perhaps to the market, there are people that hubris kind of damages, you know, people that believe their own PR, if you like. Um, and I think, I think keeping a balance between how you present yourself externally, but also knowing your own weaknesses and strengths, I think is very important. So I would say bravery in business is really important, but you've got to couple that with honesty. You've got lots of responsibilities. In, in a, if you're in a leadership position, yep, you've got yep. multiple facets to your levels of responsibility. And I know people have got to be responsible to shareholders because they own your company. Sometimes, in my case, my brother and I own it, so I wear two hats. I'm lucky. A shareholder, very lucky. But you've also got responsibility to your staff. You've got responsibility to your customers. And I think honesty to customers is, is really important as well. And one of the things we've always tried to do at Rebellion is winning a customer is difficult. Keeping a customer is easier. It's even more difficult. Uh, well, I, 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 well, I, think, I think if you produce bad product or, or you're just trying to maximize your return, it's really, you're right. Well, but if you produce good product, this is what I've tried to do, you produce yeah. good product, and when somebody's looking for another computer game or another book or another comic or even another video to watch yeah. or another podcast to watch, they'll first go, well, I like the last one this particular person did. I'll, I'll mm. have a look at what else they've got. And if you can deliver another good one, then you're satisfying them. And you go, okay, that, that they've, discovered, they've discovered you already and now they'll consume and, and, and be interested in what you make. Whereas if you, if you deliver them something cheap and nasty, it's the opposite effect. It leverages the other way yep. as well. And it's completely the opposite to that. And um, and you'll you'll therefore you'll find it harder because they'll go, those people did a bad job. They gave me a bad they gave me a piece of shit. I, the thing I bought had a good photo, but it was much smaller than I thought. It didn't work very well. I am not going to buy from them again. Now, even if you yep. even if that was a mistake and you delivered something by mistake, you've got an uphill battle to try to win them back. So it's a kind of a leverage thing. So behaving well towards your customers and clients means that they will tend to want to work with you again. That makes it easier. Well, exactly. I mean, how often did we uh, book a holiday house uh, based on some pictures, you know, and then we arrived and it was horrible. <laughs> Yes, we've all we've all done it. I mean, uh, I, I bought things. You know, you buy things online, and you, and you think, uh, oh, that's a really good picture, or that's the wrong size, or that's well, a lot uh, smaller than I was expecting. Um, I, you know, and I just think that's just bad business. But the other side, you get something that's really good that's worked well for a long time, and you think, I I'm going to buy a new one of those from the same company because that's lasted five yeah. years and it's really good, really well made, great. I have a polo shirt, which I just figured out I own now for almost 20 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I bought this, uh, I was on a dive trip in, uh, in in Australia, Mike Ball, a company, and I bought one of their, their um, dive uh, polo shirts back then, you know, and I I looked at pictures from, from last year. I said, hey, you, you still have this uh, this this shirt, and, and it's, it's almost 20 years old, you know. I mean, how often does this happen, you know, and it's still in good shape, and uh, I wear it every now and then, yeah. Yes. Well, good um, materials, things will work. I mean, yeah. our, a lot of our culture is about make something cheap and fast throw it away. and throw it away. Yeah. And that's very bad for the environment. It's really bad for us. And like you, I've got I've got pairs of trousers and um, not socks. I seem to get through socks really quickly. I, I, I literally wear my socks out, I think, because I, I do so much walking and I do so much work with the horses yeah. and um, I'm practicing tra around in my Wellington boots. So my socks don't last very long at all. But yeah, I've got shirts that are my favorite shirt and Somebody goes, well, that's, you're, you're really in retro fashion now. That's from the 80s. And I'm going, yeah, it is actually yeah. from the 80s. And I'm still wearing it. It's great. <laughs> love it. Love it. I, I learned that you set up a multimedia studio. You, over, you oversee yeah. production. Uh, um, uh, this is a very interesting topic, uh, which, which interests me. So tell me a bit about uh, this this project. Uh, just so right. Well, yeah, we've actually, we've actually acquired uh, 250,000 square foot of studio space just in the uh, in the south of Oxford, uh, where our mm -hmm. headquarters is, uh, because we want to do film and TV stuff. Um, it's another area of, of business that we think we should we should be in. And what's interesting mm. is it's a very, very conservative industry. 
their business models in film and TV are surprisingly old school. The idea that somebody decides whether I can make a YouTube video seems absurd. You know, we just make it and put it out there and people decide if they want to watch it and not. I mean, the algorithm yeah, might yeah. serve it to lots of people or a few people, but, but at the end of the day, we make something and we put it out there. You do a podcast and you put it out there and if yeah. people love it, great. Film and TV is about people telling you what you can make. You have to pitch the idea of the YouTube oh. video or the podcast to them and they go, no, I'm not sure our target audience wants that. And they go, how do you know? Why don't you just say yes, and yeah, why don't you just out. try it out, see what the market wants? And um, so the idea was to become as further independent, build up our level of independence. Yeah. Here we work, we're yeah. working with a lot of creative people, and we're working with a lot of business partners in that area. Um, it's a hard nut to crack, though. Film and TV is very old school. Yeah. Uh, people control access to the audience. Even even companies Ooh. like Netflix, you know, Netflix have their way of yeah. working. In the States, for example, we know that they're heavily unionized to protect the individual people working in the industries, and they have fights all the time. You know, we're going through that fight at the moment. The, the writers are on strike, which means nobody can write any scripts. I think the actors are working out whether they're going to go on strike next. And and it's all because of the, uh, because it's almost a walled garden. There's, there's no emancipation. There's no sort of mar access to the market. There's no access to an audience no. for anybody that wants it. Yeah, and it's probably also the, the protected world they're in. Yeah? Uh, and now with all these changes in technology, with AI and so on, they're probably very afraid that this protected world will sort of change, you know. Yeah. Um, and well, and as you said, I mean, we just created a YouTube video and put it out, you know, with low cost, you know. Yeah. But everything in the film industry is... is um, Uh, big budgets behind big investments and uh, and this is why this everything is so protected and um and close yes. yeah? yeah absolutely yeah. well you and i can we can produce a half hour or an hour long chat like we're doing now yeah. and we can get it out to the people and people can like it if they can follow us in different places try and see more of our work whatever it might be and it's taken us the time it's taken us and we haven't got too many people hanging around i've got no makeup no. on and you haven't got a wig <laughs> on and you're not you know, there's no dance routine and all that kind of stuff so we it's uh, a very it's a very um natural natural of, yeah very natural yeah. way of doing things whereas whereas hollywood is not like that but i but i also question whether it can stay like that so for example netflix at the moment are in a bit of a bind because mm -hmm. they've got shareholders their shareholders want want, want to know how well they're doing And they have to, uh, they, they let people know with data. They've got tons of data, which is great. And they determine that somebody has watched something if they've interacted with it for a certain length of time. And that certain length of time might be 30 seconds. Now, I wouldn't consider somebody watching one of my videos for 30 seconds a success. I'd think it was a failure. I'd go, oh, obviously I haven't interested you in what I'm doing. Uh, that's a shame, but well, never mind. And I need to do something about it. You know, 30 seconds would be bad, but for Netflix, it's great. But also, Netflix have to pay all the people that were involved in making it based on whether somebody's watched it. And of course, Netflix need a bigger number for their shareholders to say lots more people are watching it, but they want a smaller number because they've got to pay a percentage oh. to the people that they that made it for them as part of the deal. And I think that's a, there's a massive tension there because Netflix can modify its numbers. I, I'm not I'm not detail i don't know the details about this but if for example you wanted to massage the numbers let's say of viewers of a particular tv show you could drop Ooh. that threshold from one minute to 30 seconds and your yeah. numbers would go up but it wouldn't mean more people had watched it but the headlines no. for the shareholders might it might have a positive impact or we, or we could do it the other way you could say actually we don't count a viewing of a, a tv show as a viewing of a tv and until somebody's watched all of it in which case your numbers would collapse. And there have been plenty of failed TV shows where people watch it, they're not that bothered by it, and then they just click off yeah. because they're, just, they're not interested in it. Um, yeah. So we've got lots of data, but it's how that data is then manipulated and presented to shareholders who determine whether your shares go up or down. And a lot of these companies borrow based on their share value or the increase in their share price. And of course, that leverages them up. But when it goes the other way, it leverages the other way badly and suddenly they can't borrow the money and the banks go give me my money back please and then that causes a catastrophe i think that's bad business basically but but i've never been in the public markets but it's how the public markets work 
I don't want my business to work that way. Yeah. yeah. I just read, uh, or well, just reading uh, Dark Towers is a book about um, Deutsche Bank, uh, about um, how they run their business. And uh, just before the uh, 2008, before the crisis, their ratio between um, borrowed money and own money was 50 to 1. Yeah, I mean, so they, were, they could lend out, they had $1, but they could say they could lend yeah. $50. Yeah, yeah. So that's like me saying, uh, hey, have a have a fifty dollars, but I've only got one dollar. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, madness, isn't it? Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. But this is how how uh, they they play these games. Huh? And yeah. Uh, um as you said, I mean, uh, it, it 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 can work for a while, but uh, it can uh, go south quite quickly, uh, and uh, with a big impact on on everyone, on shareholders, but <laughs> Also on, on yeah, and if employees and the whole industry. Yeah, if your yeah. business is based on permanent expansion, it is obvious you cannot expand forever. There yeah. is there is literally a limit to the number of people on the planet or space on the planet that could buy your thing. If everybody bought an iPhone, I guess you could just sell them another one. But uh, there, there is literally a limit. That there has to be a ceiling. Yeah. Therefore, any business is going to necessarily kind of scale differently. I mean, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> we should do it again one day. will come out uh, in a couple of weeks, right? Uh, yes. Mid of July. Yes, that's right. 18th. It's published sort of in, uh, in, in all uh, support your local bookshop. I, I love bookshops, so I would encourage people to go into bookshops and order it. But it's also yeah. available in sort of all the various online places where you, where, where you buy books and available digitally as well. And at some stage, I've got to get around to doing an audio book version of it. Interesting. So, I mean... 12 chapters, uh, you go through all these, as I said, you took the chivalry code, uh, adapted it to modern life, to modern business. You put in your own stories, which is very interesting. Yes. Yes. A little bit about how I got into the whole medieval yeah. thing and uh, my first ponies and and my experiences in, in jousting and what it means to do these things. And uh, yeah, so there's a little bit of biography, a little bit of autobiography in there as well. Amazing. I can't wait uh, to uh, to finish the book. Actually, it's an interesting, interesting read. Lots of lots of learnings, and can only recommend it to the audience. Go and get it, and you dive into a complete new world. At least for me, yeah, medieval world, and very interesting. I mean, your videos on YouTube. I mean, I watched them more than thirty seconds. So <laughs> good. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, your modern history TV is the channel, and leading the rebellion is the book. And uh, yeah, I, I want to keep making cool stuff for people and and hopefully hopefully lift them a little bit out of this sort of negativity yeah. uh i'm not overly uh, i'm not a i'm not trying to be all happy clappy about it but i'm trying to make them think a little bit about life and 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 how it can be good life can be yeah. very good love it is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we um wrap up not, jason? not particularly no i'm i do what? various different forms of social media i'm a, a Re rebellion jason on twitter should anybody be interested in that uh, format i've got a uh, i do a few bits and pieces on tiktok and things like that but my main my main channels are um uh, are really youtube we will share your your links in the show notes of course uh, wonderful go check out uh, jason on youtube and um yeah i mean thank you so much being on the show my pleasure this, uh, time with me and um yeah i mean um all is best uh, for future endeavors and uh, good luck with your book launch thank you very much hopefully we'll speak again you know when you've got a moment and we can just we can just chatter about things i enjoyed it very much would love to me as well thanks jason thank you thank you for tuning into the high performance ceo show i'm your host sebastian schieke and it's been a pleasure serving you please subscribe to our show on your favorite platform and leave us a review. Your support helps us reach more listeners and create a bigger impact. Check out our website sebastianschieke.com for additional resources. Until next time, be bold, be exceptional, be outstanding, be a leader.